Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So essentially we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with five, 10 or 15 hours of great content. But now if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or wanna be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass, and then all this is yours. Hello, Internet. Hope everything's good. What's up? Your good friend Chase Jarvis here. I want to welcome you to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live show here on Creative Live. You guys know the show. This is where I sit down with the world's top creators, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. And I do everything I can with the goal of helping you live your dreams in career, hobby, and life, unpacking the brains of the most creative people on the planet. Um, if you're joining me uh, today, and I don't know where you're seeing this, it could be on Facebook Live, on YouTube live or maybe at creativelive.com slash TV. But I want you to know that if you type in the uh, questions in any of those platforms, or if you're on creativelive.com slash TV and you click uh, live chat, I can see your questions and I'm happy to pass them on to the guest today. And speaking of the guest, um, he is one of the most prolific and renowned DJs and music producers in the world. Nominated for multiple Grammys, he's the founder of Dim Mock Record Label. He's an artist and entrepreneur widely known as one of the hardest working and highest grossing musical artists and of course are an amazing guy please join me in welcoming to the show mr steve aoki in the house steve what's up what's up <laughs> good thanks for joining us where are you coming in from today presumably vegas right uh yeah yeah vegas i live out here um at my house i'm in my house right now but yeah las vegas <laughs> It's the center of it all. And I just, uh, before the we went live here, you were sharing that you um, were generous enough to get up after uh, going to sleep at 5.30 this morning, performing. What was that performance all about? Um, 
Yeah, it was like, it was like a, my first TikTok DJ set, but this time it was for Japan. So that's why it was so late. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I started out going, wow, I didn't realize this. This is like late for me now because I've adjusted to this life. But <laughs> 3.30 is no big deal in my normal <laughs> schedule. You know, like when I'm in Ibiza, 3.30 is when, when the peak time is. That's like the best time to be playing in a club. You know, you know, in Spain, they, they think differently when they party, they, they start eating dinner at like 1 a.m. You know, it's a, it's a totally different kind of way to uh, go out at night. But um, yeah, so I just did this little DJ set. Um, I have my house, by the way, is the perfect house for the quarantine because I have um, I built this house in a way where I have so many different activities that can happen. And um I have a room where I where I live stream the DJ set. It's got a foam pit, trampoline, gym. Um, you know, obviously my DJ rig, so I'm just blasting music. I could blast music at at four in the morning, and the rest of the house can sleep quietly. So it's it's nice. And I have my studio, which I'm blasting music as well, which is another room. And then I have this room, and you know, just just uh, made it in a way where I can do my content produce my content, make my music, be creative. And, um, and it's just been, I, I've never spent this much time here. So it's been incredible. Yeah. I, I bet it, you know, I think we can both agree that the world is having a tough time right now and that we can be, um, our heart can goes out, our heart goes out and we can be empathetic for so much struggle. Uh, but you know, my curious question for you is, do you like, in a weird world, of course, this is so different, but are you finding it, um, I don't know if productive is the right word because that sends like a, a little bit of a transactional um, mentality, but in a world where your life is around performance and performing for getting huge groups of people together, um, you know, how's this changed for you? And what, what are you, uh, it's, it's, you said it's a great place to be quarantined, but it's got to have been hard to manage, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I miss the stage. I miss the DJ booth. I miss playing shows and touring and traveling. Um, when I talk about with other artist friends, which I just recently did this whole little get together and we all talked about it on live, it really sunk in then because um, I was talking to Maluma and Maluma was just like, man, I miss singing. And uh, like the first thing I thought was like, I miss DJing. I miss performing. I've been performing, DJing uh, every single year for 15 years, over 250 shows, you know, up until this year. So it's it's like, it, it's a drastic change. Um, the, the road life is my home. The house life is my vacation. You know, that's, that's how I've always accepted. That's how I can, how, how I can keep going is to change the mentality of where my head's at when I'm on the road. It's not like I can't wait to get home. It's more like, uh, oh, home will be the, the vacation time. But this is like, I, you know, this is something that I'm doing, you know, more, you know, more days in the year than less. So, um, yeah, completely, it's completely it, it, different. It, yeah, it is. It is. And it, it, it took a minute to uh, find find the rhythm to be at home. You know, I mean, everything's all about rhythm for me. You know, once I have my rhythm, then I'm good. And I could like I could stay in that pocket and keep going. So it took a minute to find that rhythm being at home. And um, but once I did and just like with anything, I think this is a, a testament to um you know, allowing yourself to breathe a bit is that once you once you give yourself the space to uh, experiment and try different things, then your mind just opens up even more. So, like I, you know, we all get stuck in these like routines and patterns, and I think it's like, especially because of the way, you know, the way society pushes people to to like get out there and find your dreams and do this. And all of a sudden we get stuck in these patterns and we're like, we can't get off these tracks because uh, we have responsibilities. And then we have to continue, like we have to compound our, our creative pursuits. And, and you know, that's, I mean, that's my life, right? 
So it's hard to get off those tracks. But like at this time, this is the time to get off. Like we don't have a choice. So yeah. we're not also having that FOMO too, where, well, everyone else is doing all this crazy amount of work out there. Uh, so I need to do something too. It's like now we can actually really dive into ourselves, experiment, try things that 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 are are going to benefit us, you know, just as being a human being. So, so this is the time when I've I've been finally finding that rhythm of, of to find myself some more, and that's been great. So I've been like meditating again. I've been doing breath work lately. I mean, these are all things that I picked up and I've kind of like they've dissipated over yeah. time. But now I'm like picking them up and trying to make them more of a regular thing, um, you know. And 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 that's been great. Like the workouts, like things at home have been have been like you know very important. The self care routines have been more important for me. So um, now the goal is like when we go back to normal, is carrying that through, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, one of the things that I, I first of all, got to give you a shout out for the documentary, I'll Sleep When I'm Dead, which was an amazing film. I'll, I want to put a pin in that and come back to it a little later. But something that you said in that film resonated with me, and that is, um, I think it's related to what we're talking about right now. This is a different time. And it, you talked about sort of the the energy that the crowd gives you, the that your fans, you can sort of feel that energy is a life force for you, almost an addiction. And so while you're getting all of this like newfound energy and reconnecting with these habits that had maybe fallen off, um, are, are you getting the same life force from these other things that you would normally get from, from performing or is there nothing quite like performing and you will, you'll be happy to go back when we can have it back. Uh, yeah. You can't compare that with, it's just like when you fall in love, you can't compare that with anything else. You know, it's, um, that yeah there's nothing that compares to that you know there's absolutely <laughs> nothing it's it's uh, the great thing for me is i could i could potentially do what i do for a long time you know yeah it's not necessarily based on like my my age so much as more about my music being able to connect with that group of people you know as long as i can make music that connects with people that come see my shows that's all i care about so that's like why i'm in the studio so much is to make my shows more more of a connection, and then that, that really is the then it shows the purpose of why I do what I do, and why I'm able to tour around the world, and want want to keep going and want to, you know, fight the 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 weariness of traveling because traveling it sucks. Yeah, it it's, looks good from afar unless you have yeah. to do it for a living, and then it's jet brutal. lag sucks. Yeah, jet lag sucks. Flying around sucks. Uh, waking up early to get through security in the airports, doing that every day, day in, day out. Um, getting no sleep sucks. You know, there's a lot of things that I had to sacrifice to do this. And, and a lot of it is against my whole anti-aging, you know, brain health thing that I'm all about. Yeah. And that's not getting the sleep. And I, I mean, this time... I'm sleeping. I, <laughs> I never slept so much in my life. It's incredible. It's Probably like, more than the last 20 years combined, oh, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Like I've been sleeping good, you know. Even um, last night I went, I went to bed like at five five thirty or something like that, uh, and I woke up at twelve. You know, twelve. Actually, I kept waking up every five minutes until this interview. <laughs> <laughs> So, but like, you know, I, that's a good amount of sleep for me. That's a lot more than I normally get when I'm on the road. So, um, you know, this is, this has been like a very healing process being at home. Yeah. Home, home. Um, it can have that effect if you allow it and provide for it. Um, before you were a megastar DJ and playing in front of, you know, the world's largest crowds for the world's biggest festivals, you were a little skateboard punk from Newport, California. I was wondering if you could take us on a little journey, you know, of, you know, from being a skate punk kid who, you know, there's this DIY ethos. I came up through that same scene. So many people that are in our creator and entrepreneur community identify um, with that, that the, the DIY ethos. And I was wondering if you could, you know, help us understand what role 
that the music and that scene and that ethos played in getting you from being that teenage skate punk to to the biggest stages in the world? I'd say pretty much the backbone of my success. It's uh, it's been um, that that DIY ethos has been uh, a constant thread through all the businesses I've done, through all the different passion passions that turn into um, larger passions that turn into potential businesses or just you know things that are big parts of my life. Because uh, it it first uh, allowed me to understand if whatever I was doing really deserve that time because when you when you grow up in that kind of uh, uh, lifestyle that DIY lifestyle it's it's entirely about passion and not about um, your return it's not it's not it's like about how much you give and not what you get back what you get back and when I learned as a kid it wasn't necessarily a borrowing system of okay I give you this and then you give me money or I give you this and I get like another another physical thing it was more like I, since our scene was so small, since the DIY scene is so small, every single uh, person that contributes, it, it means a lot. And that person learns that they get, like, what, whatever they do holds a lot of weight. And that's what you get back. You get, you get back that respect of that contribution. So I, I learned that at that young age, that whatever I said, whatever I did had value. And that value was what I got back. That respect is what I got back. So um, luckily, I learned that when I was a tween, when I was a teenager. And then to be productive, what I got back was that like my friends would like would think I'm cool, or my friends would would value what I did instead of uh, you know wearing like the, the the Yeezys or wearing or like doing something that that uh, that like all the kids were like excited about or getting like that girl to, you know, like talk about you in front of your friends or something like that. It was more about, yo, I made a zine about like all the bands that we saw last night at Kinko's. And I like, look, I like, you know, Xeroxed in and glued it together and, and pasted it and took here's the pictures. And I asked him a couple questions on my shitty tape recorder and, uh, and I typed it up on a typewriter and I put it in here and here's some little poetry I have about, you know, being insecure or whatever it is that, that we talked about. Um, and then I, and I made like 20 copies and gave it to my friends and they would like freak out and they're like, yo, I want to do that with you too. And then the idea of collaboration starts, you know? And so the DIY culture has gave me, gave me kind of the steps to allow myself to understand what I want to dive into. Um, and that allowed me to pick the right choices of, of my gut, you know, pick the right choices of my career, like music, instead of going down nine to five route for me and but also it gave me that that um a, another lane which is the idea of collaboration uh working alongside your your peers because everything is not I, I learned more about dit we call it dit later on than diy because it's do, doing it together so like my me and my friends would do things the same concepts together put on the shows in the living rooms start the bands because like uh, when i first started we were we all didn't know anything about music though. We all picked up an instrument and we're like, okay, we're gonna learn. We want to be like those bands that we go see at uh, the shows every every time, every opportunity that we can get, and we'll put on the shows in our living room. It gave us that kind of also that barrier of entry where it was everything was possible. Mm -hmm. You know that was also very very important to me that 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 uh that like we could do the same thing those guys can do because. There are kids just like us in a different neighborhood, except they just have a little bit more time experience to learn how to play the guitar, to learn how to sing on the microphone, and um, and maybe their mom will allow them to to you know use their van to drive down to an area where we can go see them play, and their friend released that seven inch. It's like it was always this network like that of these kids that could try to make things happen. And it allowed us to be to have that that barrier of entry that we can get in too. So that feeling of to be able to do what what the what the people that are higher like the, up on that stage could do was was huge. So having that building this 
the, the idea that I, I, you know, first of all, I can do anything I, I can do with my friends. And second, that the DIY principle uh, laid out like my pathway. And third, that the, the idea of collaboration has always been part of everything I've been doing, whether it's music, collaborations, whether it's uh, businesses, you know, cause like, as far as businesses are concerned, you can't go anywhere by yourself. You need a team with you. You need you need to collaborate. You need minds in the room that are going to work with you, and that believe in the same vision. So a lot of that comes through. It has nothing actually. Has a lot a lot of what I learned has nothing to do with any sort of uh, uh, profit loss analysis or that kind of business acumen at all. So I, I guess like it, there is a double edged sword here because as I actually started learning how. To, you know, when I once I graduated college, and I was like, I I'm just gonna give my whole heart and everything, and just hope for the best, and cross my fingers and close my eyes, which is what I was doing. I'm like, I I found a band, they blew up, and I was like, holy shit, this band's insane. This they're so big, all the major labels want to take me to dinner, um, and you know, I'd be I'm like becoming like the cool indie label at the time when I was when I moved to LA, but I didn't know how to run a label, uh, run a business. I didn't understand the business side of things. I was more like, I'm going to put my passion in there. I got DIY principles. I, I like know what I'm doing. And like, if I fail, I'm just going to keep fighting for it. And, but with no understanding on how to make money. And then after a few years, even though I was selling tons and tons of records by, by bands that were breaking, that were gaining a lot of popularity and we were getting a lot of buzz, I still was maxing out 10 different credit cards and I was in debt like a hundred thousand dollars and there was no, there's no lifeline to pull me out, you know, cause that's yeah. a whole, whole other story that my father was clearly of a position to help me. Yeah. And for, for those folks who don't know, can you just do a little recap of, uh, your, your relationship with your dad and, and how that he, he had his own business, but you were on your own separately. Yeah. Yeah. So he, you know, he's a founder of Benihana and he was, a uh, restaurant tour he actually was you know um rags to riches story you know came to america in um in the 60s in the early 60s this is post world war ii you know about 15 20 years like 20 years after world war ii so the, the sentiment in new york was pretty much very similar sentiment that's happening right now against asians it was it was pretty harsh um and my father was trying to, uh, you know, long story short, he opened a, a restaurant. He was trying to make it, you know, he was a, um, his story is really interesting. He was an ice cream man in Harlem for, for a few years, uh, making ends meet, went through a lot of racism, finally got enough money to open up a small restaurant in New York. And, uh, and it was the first teppanyaki experience actually like the first style to, to cook in front of people um, that happened. That's no way to patent this kind of style, right? Yeah. But, um, you know, you combined Amer like, you know, uh, American entertainment value and brought in some Japanese flavor and made it and seasoned it saying that's Japanese food when it's really not Japanese food. Even the, the outfits weren't even Japanese because they don't, like Americans at the time in the 60s didn't understand sushi, and that's Japanese. They didn't understand raw fish. They didn't understand certain elements of Japanese culture. So he really Americanized it to the point where it's steak, chicken, and shrimp grilled in like, like you know, a French <laughs> A French chef hat. hat, yeah. You know, it's not even a Japanese outfit, really. You know, it might be Japanese people there, but but... You know, he he like really paved that bridge over to to the uh, New York audience, and then and then was able to um, grow the brand and was very successful, obviously with Benihana's. And um, when I was doing my thing, for him, I mean, let alone he he never supported his his kids financially. He gave us a lot as a father, like life experience. Whenever we would travel with him. He spoiled, spoiled us to, you know, to be able to see the world that he sees whenever he was able to bring us out, you know, with him. And I saw a lot. It was incredible. Like the boat, the uh, balloon 
races I used to do. I traveled in different countries. I mean, spoiled beyond belief on on that regard. But as far as um, giving us money, that was something that was against his principle. And he just he just would never do that. And and uh, even if I was failing, that's when he would never do it. That's the, that's the time when he'd be like, of course, I'm not going to help you. You need to figure this out. Actually, he told me time and time again not to do my label. And I would tell him time and time again, my bands are touring. I'm in New York because of my bands, Dad. I'm here because they sold out a show here and we sold all these records. But I didn't tell him how much money I was losing. Yeah. You know, you know <laughs> I tried to prove to him like, yo, I'm, I am doing this. Like I'm finally making it, but I did not know anything about business, right? And I didn't have a team to help me at that time. It was just me because I just didn't, I was just learning, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then I got to that point where I'm like, like, fuck, I'm, I don't know how to climb out of this. It, there's no actual step ladder to get out of this from my record label perspective. I might have to close up shop on my label, which is crazy because we're crushing it as far as what the public's concerned. Yeah. With all these different bands that were blowing up, we were definitely the sought after label to break indie bands. And um, there was no foreseeable light at the end of that tunnel. There's no way I can be like, well, this distribution check would come in and pay that off. But that just pays off the interest from now of the $100,000 of, of debt. Little did I know I had this other thing going on, DJing. And the DJing was actually a tool just to get people in a room so I can throw these DIMAC parties. Cause like, the whole time I was trying to build this DIMAC culture in LA, I was doing this. I was trying to do the same thing I was doing in my apartment in Santa Barbara. Uh, we call it the pickle patch where we have a bunch of bands playing. So the DIY principle once again wins here. It lost on the business side. Cause it's like passion first, friendship first, Go with your friends, make it happen with your passion, and like it doesn't obviously it doesn't talk about business, you know, you know, and hard right. lyrics, they don't talk about like yeah, I don't see Henry Rollins talking school. too yeah. much about business, right? Yeah. They're like they're like anti-school, like learn your own, learn your own way, um, but in any case, uh, that same principle of of building the community. I was uh, transporting that to LA and I was building a very, very small community in these very small rooms, very similar to the living rooms because these bars were like holding, you know, 60 to 80 people. And um, I didn't see that as a financial lane because I was playing at the time for a bar tab. You know, yeah. I was like, I was just lucky to get a bar tab. So, um, and I was happy with that because I was just learning how to DJ, you know, from 2003, 2004. And, and I was horrible. I was a really bad DJ, but I was a great promoter because I mean, I was, a, I was more of a community organizer when I was in, in, uh, and a show, uh, show promoter in, in, uh, when I was in high in, in college. And now I became a club promoter. And I didn't even realize I was a club promoter because I was just trying to build a community. Like that word club promoter sounds like, doesn't sound right to me because I was just trying to get the right people together that, that love this kind of music and they want to see their friends you know, that, that listen to this kind of music. So it was just a bunch of friends coming together. Eventually I get better at DJing just by, by the pure nature of doing it so much. And, uh, and, and then, you know, like the rest is history. It goes from like the bar tab to 50 bucks to 75 bucks to a hundred bucks. Um, and then, and then a hundred thousand people. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then, and then to like, uh, 500 bucks, which is, a lot of money that you can make in one night and then you have four nights a week making two grand a week times four you're making eight grand a week i mean that's a lot of money just to be like a little club promoter and a dj playing a, a couple different spots in la so I, I was actually doing quite well you know like i finally paid off my debt after that i um i i couldn't believe it. i bought my first car after my mom bought me a car when I was 16 uh from my uh from a police auction for seven grand I drove that thing to the ground and then I bought my first car myself which is a Prius with all this like look like 
stripper money or something. It was just like crinkled like tens and twenties and fives. I dumped it on the Toyota Prius, uh, to the Toyota dealership. It's like, <laughs> I'm like, this is all I got. This is, this is I, after I paid off everything. I'm like, this is the, le the leftover cash I had from all these gigs. And I was like, I want it. I need a new car. And the Prius was 20 grand and I had like $18,810 or something. I'm like, listen, man, this is all I got. This is all I got. You can take it or leave it. And the guy was like, all right, kid. dude, drug dealer. Like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a DJ. Have you heard of that? Have you heard of DJ? And then, uh, and then I bought my first car, you know, but yeah. And then like, you know, the rest is history after that, you know, like, of course it goes up from there. But I, one of the things that I found fascinating about that story it's not just not being good at business because I don't think that is inherent. I think that's a learned characteristic, especially someone who identifies as an artist. But I love the 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 role that your ethos as a teen played across that whole that whole um, experience. And arguably, you did it at a time where you know in the '90s and early early aughts where you had fewer tools. So, is there some advice that you would give? to um, people who are aspiring to do not just that path, but the, the do it yourself, like figure it out ethos, or, you know, if you had to give them a pep talk, what would you tell them? Okay. So I guess the, the one, the, the, the recap here is the DIY ethos really does allow you, cause like, it's all about figuring things out yourself. So the whole point of it is that you can achieve anything that you want in life. It might, you might not become, uh, you might not be doing it to the scale that you want to, but you could still do it. I think that's, what's important. You just have to start in a, in a place where what, whatever you're doing has to be meaningful. So like when I was playing in front of five people, like that has, that was meaningful to me, you know, like even if I, if I do a show now, um, and if I did a show with ton, like lots and lots of people, when I go back and I see like I'm doing a very small show, I ha I go back to my like younger Steve and be like, yo, you'd be so happy to be playing in front of 50 people because they all are there for you. Like you have to remember that, you know? So I, I think like the DIY mentality that I learned has allowed me to take every opportunity to be, you know, with, with mindfulness, with, with uh, gratitude. Yeah. You know, and and that's very that's very very important. And to to lead with your passion, right? So that's like the other thing about the DIY um, that DIY ethos. It's like you go where your passion goes, and then you build on that, and you build and you collaborate with other people that build on that. But uh, you know, in my lesson, you know, you can't just let passion lead entirely. You need to have street smart, and you need to have sensibility. You need to have um, you need to reel that that in to the point where you're not being impulsive either, you know? Yeah. And you're not like losing your money or someone else's money because like you're, you're so emotionally involved, yeah. you know, like being emotionally involved is incredibly important. There's no reason to not do it if, unless you're emotionally involved, but you, but for me at this point, I have that, that wisdom to know, when I should go in the deep end before I'm not ready to swim in the deep end, you know? Yeah. yeah. You, you it, and that's probably just repetition, right? Like you, you gain that through experience. And that's to me, I think a, a thing I'd hear you, I'd like to hear you comment on is like, what role has failure played? Because you clearly got in the deep end with dim mock, which for those who are just now tuning in, I'm sitting down with Steve Aoki and Steve, we've got people from, Canada, Finland, Mexico, Colorado, Greece, Ecuador, uh, Newport Beach is in the house, New York. We've got people from all over the world tuning in. And, uh, you know, you just recounted this great story of, you know, skateboard punk to world class DJ. Um, and yet you had you struggled, right? When you launched Dimmock, you found yourself 100K in debt. So it would it'd be argued that, you know, at, at some point that was a failure because you got yourself underwater here you are. And so clearly that was an important step in the process. So what, what would you say, what role has failure played for you? And would you, uh, would you prescribe some of that to, to people who are listening? Uh, failure is absolutely necessary for, for you to change and grow. 
There's no doubt about it. And then the other thing too is that after you, you've had a serious hit, uh, not not a hit like a record hit, a serious like punch in the face, a serious yeah. thing that happens to your life. Um, to to climb out of that does not just happen overnight. You know, like it takes time, and depending on how bad the fall is, you know, it's it's like. I'm 42 now. Like when I was in debt, I was 27. It took me two years to climb out of that, you know, and it took me time to even see that like I could climb out of that, you know, that that's the hard part is like that, that big question mark. Like, am I even going to make it out? You know, can I get out of this? It's, it's a horrible feeling if you're in a situation when, when your back's against the wall and, and no one's there to help you, but yourself. And you're just like, well, I got the DIY spirit, you know, I'm going to get out of this. Like, that's not enough. It's just not enough. You know, you have to learn outside of that. You can't just, and you can't like, uh, you know, just pray to something where to help you out of it. You need to like stop, holster down and really think about all the different lanes. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, you can't just, you know, you can't be, it's not linear. It's not like uh, what's right in front of you. Sometimes you have to think outside the box. The only way to really do that is when everything stops. And sometimes the only th way for things to stop is, is a big fall. Yeah. As a big bang. It's like, you know, cause we're moving at such a fast rate, especially when things are going, you know, and you don't want to stop. You don't want to stop when things are actually happening in your life. Even if something else is failing, you it's know, fair to Fair yeah. to say that then, you know, passion is critical, but some level of discipline, like none of it happens without discipline. Yeah, that's right. Discipline is a big one. Well, man, man, that segues me. I, I want to like on the concept of discipline, there's um, I want to say a quote to you and I was hoping you could react to it. Starve the ego, feed the soul. That. To me, I, I for those who are just tuning in again, I mentioned earlier watching a documentary about Steve, which is I'll Sleep When I'm Dead, an incredible film about Steve's ascension to the heights that he's at right now. And there's this powerful line. And, and um, is it like what role has Starve the Ego Feed the Soul played for you? That's uh, that was my very, very good friend, uh, DJ Am, who would say this all the time. That was his mantra. That was his you know, slogan or whatever, but it's what he said. It's like, when I think about am, I think about that line that he always say. Has that, that has that, um, have you, have you taken that to heart? What, you know, what yeah, it's absolutely. The, ways, I mean, the ways that, that it, I think it, it's, uh, it's clear that, you know, when you have too much ego, you don't, you can't really grow. You're like in this bubble. You think too much about, your own, you know, future, you know, and, and you really, you can only grow within that bubble. You know, you can only grow so much. And it's like, I think we all get there to that point where things are going really good. You know, we feel like strong, we feel confident. We're like, okay, we're going to do it my way. We're going to do it this way instead of listening to other people. Um, and it, it, the more you do that, the more of a pathway you go down, that's, a, a lonely pathway, a pathway that eventually will, you'll turn around, no one's with you. So it's like, it's, AM was a great teacher. He was a great guru and he was a very humble, humble guy. And he taught me a lot about, you know, that kind of life of just, you know, starving the ego and feeding the soul and, and feeding, you know, feeding your soul the right nutrients the right things that your body needs, your spirit needs, your, your, you know, your whole thing needs. And that's like friendship. And that's, you know, um, working together with other people and, you know, doing things for others. And it's almost like uh, he was an AA, a big AA guy. So he took a lot of those AA principles and he made them, you know, he, he translated a lot of that to me in a way that you, anyone can actually live by that code Such helping a, others you know like kind of like the hippocratic code that the doctors have 
where it's like if someone's hurt, if someone needs help, you help them out. You know, that's like kind of why we're here on this planet is to, you know, help each other out. Yeah, the feeding of the soul is it's obviously super clear in your music, uh, super clear uh, in what you share online. I'm a huge fan of the uh, Aoki boot camp. I've been known to do a few of those. <laughs> um, so what what different parts of feeding your soul uh, are you focused on right now? And it's a different time, right? You, we, we talked earlier about um, the role that performance plays in you, the energy, the life force. It's almost like this. It's like a, a I think you said in the, in the movie, a life force for you now that that's not happening. So you mentioned earlier spending time in the studio. What other things like your Aoki boot camp or can you, what can you talk about um, your routine, so to speak? You, you, you mentioned, you know, one line earlier about meditation. Can you tell us a get, fill in the picture for us a little bit about what you're doing right now to feed your soul? Um, well, with my my soul right now is all about music you know it's it's all about being creative and it's a like my therapy room is my studio if i can get into a place where i can start finding that flow because there's nothing better than finding a flow in the studio Mm. it's 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 actually much easier to get stuck on an idea and then it never really happens you know but when you find that flow when you can dodge uh, writer's block and you can dodge certain things that that really like that really make you not want to be in the studio and and uh and work um i've been able to find that right now for some reason mm-hmm. i've been working quite a lot actually i've made a bunch of new songs uh in my lane in the steve aoki lane but i've also experimented and i started making music under the side project that i've always wanted to focus on and uh, I think that this complete halt has allowed me to, you know, think outside my own box and start working on this other side project, which I'm excited to share with the world when it's time. But I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, doing a lot of the self-care routine that I'm doing, which is not just working out, but the meditation, the breath work, um, the cold plunge. Um, there's certain things that I'm bringing back into my life. Which, what is great is that like when I was on the road, if I wanted to do a cold plunge, I'd have to fill, I'd have to get like tons and bags, tons of, bags ice. of ice. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I'd have to go to, uh, you know, the ice, ice machine, this little, little, uh, the little buckets and fill up the bathtub. And that would take like an hour. And I have all my friends doing that. And then we do the, the ice plunge for, you know, for three minutes, but it's like, it's a pain in the ass here. I have um this this pool that's just cold so i just sit in there it's already ready to go and i have you know i I made a sauna underneath it so i can just sweat out like all my toxins but i have that then i do my breath work and and the meditation is like the new practice i'm bringing back in so i think with all these routines these self-care routines i'm able to think outside the box you know you never know what it is that's really helping you so you try a couple of different things. And if it, if, you know, if something's helping, you might as well just keep that going. And it's also allowed me to think outside, like, what else can I do for myself, you know, for my soul that we're talking about, um, because I have this time at home, mm-hmm. you know, like outside of doing like the, the podcasts with you and the DJ sets, you know, I am like, you know, doing my best to, think outside of that you know chess is actually quite therapeutic too i've been playing a lot of chess lately so there's a couple of different things i've been doing on the regular that's that's like a a new habit that's that's being created well yeah it's trying to make some normalcy in an otherwise you know abnormal time right um so two words i want to explore one is um collaboration you've talked about it a little bit but before we go to collaboration i want you to riff on intuition because you talked about a couple times already your gut um you talked about like listening you talked about flow listening to what you need um to your peers and creating community so how important is intuition for you how did you learn to trust yourself just riff on intuition a little bit and then we'll go over to collaboration which is obviously huge in in your world intuition then collaboration 
Intuition, uh, that's, it's entirely, a, that's like, that's, it's, it's interesting that you say those two things because intuition is really about yourself and collaboration is about other people. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I feel like I have above average intuition. How did you learn to trust it? Um, well, I mean, that goes back to failure, you know, that goes back to when you like, when you feel like you trusted something and it doesn't work. So you're just sharpening your sword, you're sharpening your intuition sword even more. I mean, like you got to trust certain things so many times. If like, you don't want to be traumatized by one big trust and then it fails and then you just kind of like back away. It's like the little, like trusting yourself a little by little and then, and then like, you know, in the beginning, you're going to fail a lot more. I mean, I'm still failing on my on my tr trusted intuition, but I'm just hardened with my expectation. So I manage my expectations and and um, follow my int intuition. Those are the two very important things going down that path. Because I, I mean, you don't want to put all your eggs in your basket and go, my intuition is guiding me here. You know, I'm going to go. I, I'm going to dive right in. You don't want to be the uh, like the doomsday preppers, like, okay, all right. I'm, I'm just like, I'm ready for, you know, like that kind of mentality. You want to, uh, you want to do like little by little. And over time, just like anything with failure over time, you're, you're just going to get better at, at what intuition feels like. I, it feels right, but I'm not going to put, I'm not going to put my right foot forward on this one, you know? Yeah. But that's also so, like, but there, there's a belief in entrepreneurship or taking any chance that you're like, you have to go all in and put it all on red. But I don't actually know anybody who's super successful that behaves like that. You know, there's this oh. like, you build up a muscle of trying and failing and trying and failing. And it's almost like you get better at recovering. You don't get any better at not making mistakes, but you get faster at recovering or trusting yourself. And that's what I'm, I'm picking up in, you know, the, the way that you're articulating this you know, this concept of failure, trust, repetition, I don't know, it feels like a virtuous circle somehow. So this is like, uh, the intuition side of things I'm talking about has a lot to do with failing so hard in business, failing so hard in business early on has, has really tempered my into uh, my intuition, my gut and my impulse to react to it. You know, like your intuition is always telling you something, right? It's always like you feel it and you're like, okay, go for it. And, uh, on the business side of things, there's like two worlds. There's the business side and there's the music world. There's the creative side and the, and the business side. Creative side, I allow my intuition to kind of roam free a lot more. Because um, at the end of the day, if a song con is considered a failure that comes out, it's not a failure to me. The, the, the minute that I'm finished with it, I've already deemed it success. Because I'm happy with it. It's part of me now, and I'm allowing that to be part of the world, what, regardless if people like it or not. You know, you, like when you finish a book, it's like, you know, just because it didn't sell as well as a previous one doesn't mean it's worse. You know, it has nothing to do. Like some of, some of the best songs out there aren't very, or like rarely listened to. You know, some of my favorite songs that I've done have the lowest streams. It doesn't mean that I have less heart into it. You know, it's like, uh, I believe in this concept. I'm going to put it out. If it's neon future and I want to really put all my heart into it, I'm going to develop that into a uh, music series, album series, and, you know, team up with Tom Bill, you and build that into a comic series, regardless of the success, we're putting our entire heart into it. There's no, there's no, um, that's intuition there, right? That's intuition. Yeah. That's the creative component. So we don't know if it's going to be successful before we sink in all our money, sink in all our heart, sink in all our time, bring in all these professionals to, to really believe in our vision and, and, and also put in all their time, you know? So a lot of the creative side is very different from the business side. When I go into investing, when I go into, uh, like, what where what locations Pete Aoki is going to open in or like different things I'm doing on the business side 
I'm thinking differently on intuition. And that's a lot more on the collaboration. I, I really rely on professionals and experts in that field to help me guide if my intuition is correct. And then know this is where your ego can get in the way and make the wrong decision as well. You know, you need to like really temper your ego. Because intuition can sometimes be disguised as an ego, you mm -hmm. know, because yeah. you're like, oh, well, I'm the entrepreneur here. I had so much success. You have to trust me. No, that's not necessarily the case all the time. You know, everyone has fails, no matter how, how big of a track record you've had in that, that area. So like business and, and then like music creative side, there's two different worlds as far as how I see in my intuition being played out. Brilliant. Collaboration, collaboration yeah. is it uh, goes across the board in everything I do. You know, like without a team, I don't. I am, I am a very, very. By success, it would not be here. There's but no what team. about people who say, "Yeah, but it's your name on the door, Steve. It's clearly you. It's your music." What would you tell those people? Um, yes, I, I have the creative component side, but like, there's a lot of hands. There's a lot of moving parts that go into getting that music out there. Yeah. There's a lot of decisions that, that need to take place. There's a lot of, of strategy that needs to happen to get that music so that you can hear that music. You know, from my management to the, the my marketing team to publicists to the radio promoters to, um, you know, the, the label side of things, what's happening on the label side of things. Um, and then goes on to the other side, to the, the Spotify uh, uh, you know, playlist people that like decide to put your song in there, you know, to whatever it might be to get you to hear it. You know, like all these people there, they have a lot of times they have a thankless job, you know, they don't, their name is not on that door either, you know? Yeah. So it's like the, you know, I, I am, I am very little without them and and I need them. Pete Aoki, same thing. I work with a big team. With Dimock, my fashion, on my Dimock collection, I have like an incredible team that I work with in order to get all these, you know, products and, and T-shirts and, and pieces out to the world. You know, like whatever I'm doing, like the team is, is a large part of it, you know. Whether I make decision or not, you know, it, it, that's, that goes beyond that. It's like everyone else is working so hard to make this happen. Yeah, you wouldn't even be in a position. I think a lot of people on Instagram say, oh, yeah, he just walks out and he tries on a new T-shirt. It's a Dimock collection. It's hard to yeah. understand and communicate that there was like 60 people who put that together yeah, for you to like, just... Like this shirt right here, Yeah. you know, this was a collaborative effort to, to make this this uh, particular, you know, character that was an inflatable on my tour. You know, and it might, it might have been my idea to be like, okay, I want to have this inflatable these two inflatable like 10 foot stat toy statues um, on the stage. But, you know, I'm like, okay, here's like the color palette, but like, let's put this together. You know, there's someone that was like building out the body and someone that built out like the pupil. And I'm like, Hey, make that pupil a little bigger. Okay. How about let's try this, put this eyebrow here. I love the eyebrow. So it's like, definitely like um, I love, that's why I love fashion similar to music is that there is that creative collaborative component where it's like we're putting art together wearable art together in a way you know and you know whether it's music whether it's uh drawing and painting and sculpting or doing fashion that the artistic creative component kind of is the thread between all that amazing uh, if you're just tuning in I'm Chase. I'm sitting down here with Steve Aoki. We've uh, covered a ton of ground, collaboration, intuition, um, the DIY culture, how to manage ego, how to feed the soul, morning routines and habits. Steve, I want to thank you so much for your time. We've got people coming in from all over the world thanking you so much. Uh, one person in particular, DJ Havoc, wants you to know that someday I'm going to be signed by you. Loves this dude, loves Dim Mock. Um, awesome. From the Creative Live community, for me personally, I want to say thanks so much for being on this show and sharing your wisdom. And uh, we we are excited to hear about this new project when you emerge from um, 
from the yeah. cave, <laughs> from, from the cave, and get to share yeah. it with the world. Really appreciate your time today, Steve. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks man. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right, everybody. I'm Chase. 